let the ushers know wherever you are, you are sat and they can give you an envelope to be able to make do and do your offering. Amen. Praise God. Wow. Like the Christian said, June, June is here. Um, June is one of the most precious months in our family. Um, we seriously always love it. And then it's always a time of bounty, bounty surprises for us. And we know that this year won't be a different in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I, I have a clip for us to watch. Um, if we can clip, if you can please um, have a quick look on the screen. The media team are going to put it up and let us see. Can we sure start from the beginning? Lights, please. Thank you. There's an old business fable about commitment. First time I heard it was years ago, I was watching a video of Dartmouth's rowing coach. He was telling a story to inspire his team. And basically in this story, there's a father, there's a son, they're sitting down at breakfast, and the son says, Dad, I'm learning about commitment versus contribution in school, right? I'm trying to grasp it, but I can't quite understand the difference. The father thinks about it for a minute and says, look down at your plate, what do you see? Boy says, ham and eggs. Father says, well, that chicken made a contribution to your breakfast. That pig made a commitment. He then goes on to tell his team to row like pigs. And that simple metaphor created a foundation for everything that's come through my life since then. Right, in anything we do, there's the option to go all in or to walk the line, to hedge your bets. And people so often leave or quit when something becomes difficult because there's another door they've left open, right? There's an easier way, an escape route. But let me ask you this. Do you think if it was a life or death situation, right? Say you needed water to survive. Would you give up after looking for three hours and coming up empty handed? Of course not. You'd keep looking because life depended on it, right? There's no other options available. There's this old saying that if you want to take the island, burn the ships, commit. And it's not until you do this that things truly begin to change, that progress is made at the highest level. You simply cannot tiptoe to success. You can't sneak up behind it. You have to own it, right? Go after what you want like the world is on fire, like your universe revolves around making this happen. I have never in my 28 years of existence seen a lion walk up to a gazelle and hope that it falls over, right? It attacks it with everything that it has, speed, strength, tenacity. That's what brings home the prize. If you and your goals aren't one, if they are not the same, that's a pretty good indicator that you are fighting the wrong fight. You should live and breathe your dreams. Inhale and exhale them. They should live at the forefront of your mind, where every thought that comes through your head should be in the context of that dream. That basic question, how bad do you want it? Well, if you're not willing to fully commit to dive into something, then that gives you a pretty good answer right out of the gate. You can talk about hours spent, routines, habits, but if you aren't passionate about what you want, if you don't immerse yourself in it, none of that really matters. Live how you need to live. Do what you need to do. Be who you need to be to make your dreams real. Fully commit to excellence. Because until you do that, you will be left with only a vision and a false sense of reality. Winners don't have time for that. Okay, set your mind to your target and crush it. That is the only option. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to use that to um, draw the attention of some of us who have not necessarily been able to benefit of it. We have Saturday lounge, we call it, 
here in this church where we, we find the time to discuss and have group chats from our various homes on the, on the, on the Zoom. And we talk about how to live a life of Christ and how to live a life that is worth living for, a winning life. And um, our, our teaching team put this together. We have various groups in the church where we encourage people to be in their groups, um, the 25 to, 30, 25 to 36, and then we have, no, 35, 25 to... Okay, let's, let's hear from Bajago. Yeah. Yes. 36 to 45. And over 45. Now, this is one of the videos that was made available to instigate discussions. I know the quality of discussions there. You know, some things you, you wish you could get when I preach on Sunday or when you listen to the teachings on Wednesday, but you can't get them. They will come from life experiences that are shared amongst brethren. They, they will come from testimonies that you hear from how people went through their own instances. I mean, that lovely scripture that Pastor Wally shared with us this morning, that we are comforted from the standpoint of how we have been comforted out of what we have been through. So when you are able to share those testimonies, people might not be able to read it from the scriptures or from the Bible or get it from the teaching messages. But when you share your testimony, they will say, wow, if that person can go through it and come out winning, then I can go through it and come out winning. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you, join on Saturdays. is at 6 p.m. I know you'll be powerfully blessed. But you see, one of the reasons why I want to share this message, or I want to share from this message, is going to be an extract of a message I shared in March 2018. I titled it then, The Compelling Life of Jesus. The Compelling Life of Jesus. You know, Jesus had an oral around him. Some of the things that made Jesus stand out was the message of the cross that he brought, he brought for us. The cross is the symbolic standpoint or the posture of the, of the commitment that Jesus made for us. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The giving of Jesus, what did it cost Jesus? It cost Jesus to lose his life as, an, as a person. And that illustration in that video clip at the beginning says, each time you have a breakfast, there are different people who contributed to the breakfast. The chicken did, but the chicken made a donation. What, are, what did the chicken donate? The, the chicken donated its eggs. So when you're talking about what did it cost the chicken? Oh, just one of his eggs. When the pig was going to say, what did you put into this breakfast? The pig would say, I gave all. Because the pig died for you to have the breakfast. Jesus carried the cross for us. The cross of Jesus was his commitment to the fact that God wants us and he wants us badly. Knowing that God so wants us badly, Jesus said, I will give my life for these guys to come back and be returned to God. You know, the carrying of the cross of Jesus, he had to do it by himself. And that will make me to let you know that your commitment cannot be done on your behalf. Nobody can carry your cross for you. Oh, Joseph the Arimathea came to help Jesus, isn't it? Did he die on the cross? No, he just, when Jesus was tired, physically tired, drained, and he could barely move. In fact, why he was, why Joseph was asked to come and help him was because he was slowing the people who wanted to go and kill him, was slowing them down. 
They wanted to get to Golgotha quickly so they can kill him, nail him to the cross and, and, let, and kill him. So they said, you, you are delaying us. You are dragging too much. Let's get somebody to help you carry this cross. So they got Jesus, I mean, they got Joseph the Arimathea to say, carry this cross for him so we can get to this place. So they carried him and then they had time to now whip him out of existence. When he got, when they got to Golgotha, and I saw Golgotha when I went to Israel. It looks like a place of death, truly. They didn't put Joseph the Ramathia on the cross because it wasn't his commitment. Who did they put on the cross? They put Jesus on the cross. He's the one committed to the redemption of man to God. Listen to me and listen clearly. Whatsoever your dream is, like we saw in that clip, whatsoever the purpose of your life is, whatsoever God has written your DNA upon or behind, whatsoever it is that from before the foundation of days, God has woven into you, that through you I'm going to get this done. God needs your commitment at it. And your commitment, you can't borrow it to somebody. Of course, Jesus allowed Joseph to carry the cross, but it was just for a short walk. When they got to Golgotha, the cross found who it belongs to. You might run away from your commitment. You might delay it, but listen to me. Your commitment will find you out. Your commitment will follow you. People can help you, but they can't carry it for you. I look at the dictionary meaning of the word compelling because it's not good enough to just tell a story. The, I mean, people who have passion for telling stories, they have what is called a compelling telling of stories. That once they start, you cannot but listen to them. There are people like that. They just need to start. The word compelling, if you look at it in the dictionary, it have other synonyms. I mean, the meaning actually says to bring about something by the use of force or pressure. So for you to compel something to come out of, if you buy a toothpaste from the shop and you take it home, just leaving the toothpaste on your table does not, or your sink, does not make it to come on your toothbrush. What do you need to do? You need to apply some pressure. When you, the more pressure you put and apply on the toothpaste from the tube, then it releases for you what you want, wanted. Compelling is synonymous to force, to coerce into, to pressurize into, to, comp, to impel, to drive, to press, to push, to urge, to prevail, and more and more. Words like that. You have got to give a backing to whatsoever the promise is. And not just a mouth backing. It has to be a total backing that is compelling to anybody who sees it. Jesus, I'm sure, would not be the first person to ride donkey into Jerusalem. No, I don't, I don't believe so. Because riding of donkey was a general mode of transportation at that time. It's like driving a limo now, or a Bugatti now. So Jesus will not be the first person to ride a donkey into Jerusalem. But there was a way Jesus appeared on that donkey that day on the way to Jerusalem seven days before he was going to be crucified. And the Bible said in Matthew 21, it, it, it mentioned the fact that Multitude came to see him. Multitude came to listen to him. Multitude came to follow him. Multitude spread their clothes on the ground. They took off their clothes on the ground. They put it on the floor and said, walk on it. Ride on it. 
The God palm front and says, God Almighty, roll the red carpet on the ground and say, Jesus, ride on it. Multitudes shout, they sang his name and praised his name, singing Hosanna to the God of heaven. My question today to you and to each of us and to including myself is how compelling are you? I thought Pastor Wally saw my note when he was leading us to pray this morning when he said, when people think about you, what comes to their mind? When people remember your name. You know, I have a message I'm preparing here. It says, 100 years from now. 100 years from now, if somebody mentioned your name, what will they say? What will people say? If Jesus hasn't come, I mean, 100 years from now, none of us will be here. Who, want, who wants to be here? Okay, probably... Um, Mui was, Mui was, Mui was, uh, ah, don't shake your head. No, no, yeah, yeah, I said your son. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying your son. Probably the, you know, the, the youngsters, the one-year-old. It's, it's not a problem to live beyond 100 years. But 100 years from now, what am I doing here? Pastor Wally, what are you doing here? Wally, I mean, this is what is. What are you doing here? You can be here. I mean, myself and my wife, we cannot be here. We won't be here. We won't be here because things will have changed. We'll have taken a new turn. You know, the first thing that happened when I heard the story that my dad died, and my mom actually, it happened the same the two times. When I entered into their rooms, I looked at the things that my parents normally do and use every day. Every day. It is very peculiar to them. They cannot but use it. I mean, some of them, if you touch it, my, my, my dad will almost break your head. I look at the thing. For now, you remember. The thing, just, it's just there. I just looked at it. I said, look at this thing now. The man cannot even hold it. Is, a, is useless to him. Not, they can't do anything with it. That is how we will all be. In the scheme of things, eventually, everything that you think is so important, that is so good, that is so full of life, that you cannot do without, every of them, you will do without them. What is it that you are compelling people with? And the second question is, what are people compelled to when they think about you? In other words, what attraction do you, do you give to people? What is it that when people see you do, they want to do the same? The Bible talked about Jesus in the book of Acts 10, 38. It says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devils, for God was with him. What is it that you are doing, carrying, speaking, talking about that people and other people want to do because you do them? And when you look at it, is it in line with what the Bible tells us God wants us to do? Those of us who profess to be Christians. We're not talking about people of the world. We're talking about those of us who say to we're, we're Christian and we, those of us who seek to be leaders like Jesus. We must show the same level of commitment, the level of compelling 
like Jesus did. To draw us to what God has sent us to do. You know, psychologists tells us that every single day, each and every one of us have influence over at least 10,000 people. Every day you wake up, you have the capacity to influence 10,000 people. These, they are not 10,000 people that you speak with. These are 10,000 people. In fact, I'm sure when they were doing that, there was no social media. There's no social media. By one post, you can influence so many. Maybe times 10 of that. Do you know sometimes you, you are just walking on the street with your clothes flowing, and somebody will, say, will look at you and say, wow, I'm going to dress like that on Monday. <laughs> you, you, they haven't spoken to you. But they are going to dress like you dressed on Sunday. They will dress like that on Monday. Influence. Some people will look at you the way you raise your children. Or the way that you are talking to your children. I will say, wow, this is the way I want to bring up my children. You are influencing them. People will look at you the way you are eating right. How you are saying you want to avoid eating this, avoid eating that, drinking water, not drinking water. I mean, there's a friend of mine that I know. He is now giving me concern. The way I see him download canned drinks. He's giving me concern. And I'm praying for the day I'm going to tell him. So I won't be too late. People see you, what you do, and they make up their decision that they are going to do the same. When I newly got my new hair, haircut, my new hairstyle, I know somebody, some people said, uh-uh, which one is Pastor Jay doing now? I didn't even look at them. But not long from then, as I see one or two people now looking like me. When my same kind of hair cut, I said, wow, it's working. Now, not that I said you should do my hair cut. No. This is mine. This is my trademark. In fact, I went to research what they call it. I know the name. I should tell you. In private. <laughs> Praise God. So, what am I saying? I'm saying, do not think you are living your life just without any accountability because even those that you influence directly or indirectly, you are going to be accountable for them. That is the hallmark of living our lives. There's nothing that you and I do, and that's, that is what cautions me the most. It cautions me the way I live my life in front of my children. It cautions me the way I live my life when my wife is there, or even when she's not there, because she will hear. What I'm saying is that I am most desperate to make sure that I lay an example that is unquestionable. Why do I do this? I am accountable. If you are going to be accountable in life, you will be cautious of what you do Wherever you do it. There is a cost to living our life in a compelling way like Jesus did. To live a compelling life like Jesus, you must be ready to give your life and probably lose your life for people. Because he did the same. Actually, somebody said, if you are not ready to die every day you wake up, you are not going to be able to live your life pleasing to God. Every day you wake up and you can breathe. <sighs> you must die again. Because when you are dead to yourself, then you are able to live your life for God. 
That is why it is so easy. Children, the first language children have, know how to ask is why. Come here. Why? Sit down here. Why? Don't go out. Why? Don't touch this. Why? It is the question. It why? They want to know. But it is important not to shut them down because it is better for you to teach them and let them know why they mustn't do it because either you like it or yes, they're going to find out. And God help you if they found out from the wrong person. Because they will find out. They'll find out. In Matthew 11, 29 to 30, Matthew 11, 29 to 30, Jesus gave us this challenge. Say, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. Easy to bear. And the burden I give is light. The burden that God or Jesus gives to you, the reason is light because it's a tested burden that has an end result. None of us seated here or listening to me over the digital platform, none of us is physically built to carry the burden of life. When you use your human nature to carry the burden of life, it kills you. It breaks you down because you are not built to carry it. That's why Jesus said, my burden is light. When you carry your burden, you are carrying your issues with the burden that God gives to you in Christ Jesus, he lightens it because you know, like that scripture, I mean, that, like that um, clip says at the end, it says, I will be with you forever because I love you. If you allow God to carry your burden for you, either you like it or yes, either whosoever like it or yes, you can't lose. You're on the winning team. When you live a compelling life like Jesus did, it gives you, it gives you the chance to live a wise life. I mean, a life full of wisdom. It gives you a chance to make wise choices and it connects you with heaven. You know, you, you'll be able to know and explore the things that touches the mind of God, not what touches your life, your feeling, what you want to do and what you feel like doing. I shared with the leaders yesterday on a title called Not My Will. Jesus at Gethsemane looked at the crust of what he was about to face and the commitment that he has given. He said, I wish I can change my mind. But yet, he said, I can't change my mind because I am committed to get it done. And he went ahead and get it done. In the same way, you must be ready to make wise decisions that will make sure that you get things done as it's supposed to be. When you live a, a compelling life, it revives and transforms lives around you, not just your own life. It transforms lives around you. Jesus, even on the cross of Calvary, after he was hung there, he was still, even in that dying minute, was able to get the the thief on the right, into paradise. Why? Because that compelling nature of Jesus was just, was just awesome. When you live a compelling life like Jesus did, it is genuine and you cannot fake it. You can't fake, you can't fake God. 
It's either you are for God or you are not for him. You can't be on, this, on the fence. You can't be on the fence with God. Lastly, when you live a compelling life like Jesus did, it is fruitful. It's fruitful. It is fruitful because it will continue to bear fruits. Some people will hear it and they will do the same. Someone will hear your story, your testimony, and they will do the same. Look at the wonderful testimonies we, we we heard this morning. Fantastic. Somebody will hear that and say, wow, is that how people can stand for their right? I'm going to do the same. Let me see that my manager tomorrow morning. I will tell him what I deserve. That is how it is. It inspires you. It makes you know how to do things correctly. It's not just doing things that matters. There is a way to do things correctly. And if you don't do it correctly, you don't get the reward of those that did it correctly. Everything done must be done correctly. The reward of living a compelling life is priceless. It is priceless because it's fulfilling. Fulfilling. You know, take the story of a a rough diamond in the mud. When diamonds are mined, when you see it, it doesn't appeal. But there's a path that that diamonds that is rough with stones and mud, there's a path that you must follow. As long as he's ready to follow that path, that diamond will glitter. Your glittering is dependent on your desire to go through the process. My last scripture to us this morning is Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It says, come to me, all ye who are weary and carry heavy burden. There are people, when they see you carry heavy burden, they run, they run for you, from you. They say, ah, mm, better don't go near him or her. But Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and those of you who carry heavy burden, say, I will give you rest. I prophesy over you in this month of June that her rest is coming to you. Rest beyond your imagination. You're there on the digital platform, listen to me over the internet. Technology does not affect the word of God. As you listen to me this morning, I say, cast all that cares unto God. And he will carry that burden for you. He will lighten it up and help will visit you. The rest of God is in your hand in the mighty name of Jesus. He's inviting you. He knows how temperamental, he knows how burdensome, he knows how crushing the weight of burdens could be. But he's inviting you. Come. Come to me. This morning as we take the communion, I'm going to ask for you to ask God to take your burden from you. Hand it over to God. You have carried it long enough. I don't know what burden you are carrying. Maybe burden of sickness. And doctors have told you that, oh, this is going to go this way. We've just had a testimony of somebody who got healed from a stage 4 cancer. Powerful testimony. If you can hand it over to God, the Bible says the hand of God is not too short to heal. Maybe yours is lack, the burden of lack. Why not talk to God this way and say, God, 
this is what I lack. Maybe for you is the burden of someone, a loved one. And I know that that, is, that can be very crushing. When you are okay, but a loved one is going through very terrible situation that is giving you helpless night, sleepless night. I beg your pardon. Maybe a son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a friend, an uncle, a nephew, whoever it is, your grandma, your grandpa. The burden they are carrying is crushing you. You wish they could pass it to you so you can bear it for them. This morning, Jesus is stretching his hand to you. Say, come. Come to me. Come, let me take care of this burden. And this morning I'm saying to you, why not roll it over to God? The burden of not having fruitlessness. The burden of not being able to fit in into what others are doing. Roll it over to God. God knows how to multiply. Mephibosheth was left in the backyard of the, of the mountains, forgotten. He took God just with one recommendation to get him from Lodiba back to the palace. God can do so much. For Joseph in the prison, it just took one step for God to take him from the prison into prime ministerhood and he became the prime minister of known world then. What can God not do? Father God, we are asking of you today, let rest come unto your people. Rest that cannot be hindered. Rest that cannot be in any way held back. Rest that you yourself, you have ordained for us from before the foundation of days. As we bless, O oh God, and receive of this communion today, we ask that let the, let the Spirit of God activate the rest of the Master upon our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the rest that comes from you penetrate every nooks and corner of our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the rest of the Father come afresh and anew this morning. For there's nothing that is impossible for you to do. Father God, we give you praise. We ask that you bless this communion, O oh God. Both the one that is here and for those who are on the digital platforms that we are praying, Father God, bless the emblems in their homes and in their hands this morning. Our desire is to partake in this communion together and be strengthened with assurance that hope is here for us, that rest is is here for us that goodness and mercies will follow us from this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you. Jehovah God, we bless you. We honor you, O oh God. We give you praise. We magnify you, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. The minister is going to help us. Please take one of the communion. Somebody say, rest is coming to me. Yes, rest is coming. Rest is coming to you to reside with you in the name of Jesus. As you receive your own emblem, just be reflective in that mood and just talk to God. If there's a specific area that you want God to bring his rest into your life, Talk to him and say, God, I'm expectant. I'm expectant in this area. I call you. I hand over this area into your life, into your hands, oh God. I hand over this area into your, life, into your hands. I ask of you to bear me, oh God, help. You invited me. Here am I. I have come. Bible says for everyone who come, their hopes will not be dashed. Today, O oh Lord, as we have come, either we are here physically or we are here on the digital platforms, listening and connecting with this 
invitation I ask, oh God, that we have come for you. Let there be an impact upon our lives today. Let rest visit us. Let rest stay with us. Let rest be accommodated in us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let rest fill our lives, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus. For you are all in all. Father God, we thank you. We are grateful to you. Oh yes, Lord. Oh ye garabo sundoli hata yeke. Okay. I'm sure everybody now has. If we can just open the emblem and take the first part of it, the Bible says on the same night that he was crucified, he took the bread and he breaks it. And the Bible says, he said to his disciples, Father God, we ask that you bless this communion bread as we receive it as the body of Jesus that was broken for us, that took our place so that we can be found non -gui not guilty anymore, so that all our shortcomings can be declared null and void. Today, oh God, we're stepping into that position that has been given to us, and we excel in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your rest, oh God, envelop us and consume our lives. Fill us from head to toe in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your good, good God to us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Receive the body of Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the same way the Bible says he took the cup, even the cup of the blood of Jesus, the blood that was drained out of him, the blood that was the price that he paid. Father God, we hold each one of this blood emblem in the name of Jesus. Though we have them differently in our hands, but they form a part of the same cup. The cup that was given to us by Jesus himself. It says as often as we will, we should take this in remembrance of the price that he paid. This morning, oh God, we press into that assurance, into that prophecy. And we ask the Lord, we receive this cup. Let this cup be a price paid for our liberty, for our freedom, and for our dominion in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you very much, oh God. We walk by faith. In the name of Jesus. We walk into freedom. In the name of Jesus. We receive the rest of God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you because you are good. We thank you because you are kind. We thank you because you are faithful. In Jesus mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Receive the blood of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you, O God. Father, receive.